A, or what we're already talking about, is what the structure of those pre-linguistic cognitive forms might be. And I'm, I'm offering that to you partly as an element of the integrating theory that I told you I would try to deliver in the first lecture, and also as a, a means of giving you a, a schema or a language to start to understand what symbolic representation means from a psychoanalytic perspective. And I'll ho I hope that will be very useful. I mean, it's, it's been extraordinarily useful for me because it offers a key to understanding symbolic literature and symbolic modes of cognition. So, for example, religious systems are symbolic modes of cognition par excellence. That's what they are. And they're not, they're not primitive theories about the nature of the objective world. That's a foolish way of looking at religious systems. And it sets up an artificial dichotomy between religious belief and scientific belief. And all that does is confuse people. So religion, religious belief is primarily about morality. And morality is about how to act. And religious symbolism is about how to construe the world as a forum to act in. And that's what you... You have to solve that problem because the big pro biggest problem you have in your life and the biggest problem you always will have is how the hell should you act? And, you know, that actually might be the fundamental question of existence to, de to the degree that action is the primary reality. Now, you know, if you're a materialist, you don't really think that way because you think of the objective world stripped of its subjective importance as the ground of reality. But it's not the ground of reality. The ground of reality is whether or not you survive and reproduce, at least from a Darwinian perspective, and that means that the most important element of reality is how you act. That determines how, whether or not you're going to be selected, so to speak, for reproduction. And people are, like, evaluating each other on the basis of their fitness for reproduction nonstop. It's like almost all of social congress has to do with that. You know, men organize themselves into very strict dominance hierarchies, by competing with one another, and women peel the men off the top. And almost everything that you're doing in your day-to-day -day interactions with other human beings is an element of that fundamental process. So that's all action-oriented. So, so it's very much important to get these things right. So I'm going to t tell you, you know, how I piece this together to some degree. And so we're going to start with the hypothesis. We'll take a look at this. There we go. So, one of the things you might ask is, what do our immediate mammalian relatives, how do they conceptualize the world? And so we're going to assume that those are higher order primates, because, you know, the evidence seems to suggest that we're relatively genetically similar to chimpanzees in particular, and also to bonobos, which are more or less a form of chimpanzee, although their behavior differs. And it looks like we diverged from the precursor to chimpanzees, bonobos, and human beings about seven million years ago. So we didn't come from chimps. Chimps, bonobos, and us came from something that was the precursor to all three. And we know you can calculate how similar you are from a genetic perspective to another organism by measuring if you split your DNA into its, it, into its halves and then you mix those DNA halves with the DNA halves of another animal, they'll join up. And the more related you are to that animal, the more energy it takes to pry them apart once they've joined up because they're a tighter match. And so it turns out that we're, you know, extraordinarily tightly matched with chimpanzees. So, um, so when, you know, you're wondering why you're so erratic it's, and, and uncontrollable and unpredictable, it's because you're basically a chimpanzee that's been driven insane by self-awareness. So, you know, what the hell do you expect from something like that? You know, it's amazing that we can even all sit in this room together. So, anyways, you know, you might ask, well, what do creatures like that know? And one of, the, one of the things that we've been able to determine are some of the precursors or associates of, of cortical development of brain size. And there's various things that seem to be tightly associated with the development of larger brains, but one of them in primates in particular is size of group. So the bigger your group, the more you have to keep track of, the more social information you have to keep track of. And if that's driving brain development, at least in part, because it's certainly not the whole story, if it's driving behavior in part, one of the things that that implies is that one of the most important sources of information that you have to contend with if you're a social primate is the social structure. And so what you can infer from that 
is that your brain is primarily set up to assess social information. Now, you can take that a little bit farther, and then you might think, well, that means that may imply that the primary categories that you use naturally, so to speak, to understand the world are, in fact, social categories. And then you could think, well, you know, we've, we've elaborated our cognitive systems up into the abstract far farther than our primate relatives have. But because evolution is a conservative process, new structures have their roots in old structures, right? It's a necessary part of evolution because once an organism walks down a certain psychophysiological road, in some sense it's destined by that road, which is why you have the same basic bodily platform as virtually, well, not only mammals, but vertebrates in general. You know, four legs, two eyes, it's a very, very standard form. So, you know, once it's developed, that's it. That's the platform upon which further variation takes place. 